three days ago, my daughter said, I think I'm non-binary because she saw it on social media, let's say. I bring her to you. You send us to a therapist. Therapy sees us a couple of times, sends us back to you in order to see a doctor to be prescribed hormones. Potentially, yes. Jesus fucking Christ. In the States, oftentimes, if anything about gender gets brought up in a pediatrician's office, they immediately just refer you to the gender center. So I could be getting an intake where a kid maybe told their parent three days ago that they thought they were non-binary and asking for they, them pronouns, and yet they're already landing in a specialized medical clinic that does hormones. So there were some intakes where it was just, it, it made absolutely no sense. The entire concept of kids being allowed to explore their gender and explore these concepts have been almost wiped off the map. And what would happen? Let's say I bring my 12-year-old daughter to you. Three days ago, she said that she's non-binary. She wants they, them pronouns. What happens to her from there? So initially, I would try to be encouraging you as a parent to find a therapist and start working with a therapist for your kid. Um, but the minute you're talking to me on the phone, you have already started on a pathway. Because the only therapists that I have to refer your kid to are therapists who are going to affirm their gender identity, not question it at all, and potentially as soon as I say, take your kid to that therapist, that therapist might see them for one or two visits and send them right back to the center to get started and seen by the people that prescribe hormones. So three days ago, my daughter said, I think I'm non-binary because she saw it on social media, let's say. I bring her to you. You send us to a therapist. Therapy sees us a couple of times, sends us back to you in order to see a doctor to be prescribed hormones. Potentially, yes. Jesus fucking Christ. Sorry for my language. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so let's look at this. What do we mean by puberty blockers? What do we mean by these drugs? And what are the potential side effects of these drugs? So the puberty blockers we were using were mostly their implants that go into the arm or their injectables that are used mm -hmm. on a monthly or three-month basis. Um, in our center, you had to be at least in the very initial start of puberty to get a puberty blocker. Um, but one of the things we were starting to see was that some of the kids put on the puberty blockers, mental health was getting worse once they started the blocker. And that's mm -hmm. against what the narrative tells us. The narrative says these interventions are supposed to make people better. And what we were seeing was parents calling and saying, my child has had the blocker in for a month. They're crying every day. They've had the blocker in for three months and they're now failing out of school. Um, things that were supposed to be better, getting better were getting worse. In the center that I worked in, um, I started there when we were still supposed to be operating under the WPATH guidelines, uh, standard of care seven, which had some age kind of ideas for when people were supposed to start hormones. Um, WPATH 7 was supposed to be 16, and it said only in rare and, you know, kind of urgent cases should you be under the age of 16. We were pretty much putting anybody on testosterone at 13 and a half if that's what they wanted and they got to us in time. And what does that do to you if you are a young person who's been given testosterone? Well, it depends. So if you were given a blocker first. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we blocked you and then put you on a cross-sex hormone. We are potentially basically causing you to be infertile for life. And testosterone, um, you know, the, the, the effects that kids reported that they wanted happened pretty quick. So we would permanently affect your voice and your voice would be dropped into a male pitch uh, you would see growth on your clitoris into what we would refer to as a micro penis. Um, we would 
start seeing atrophy and your vaginal canal would start to have atrophic features. Your All of your body fat would start to move and shift around. Um, you would have facial hair growth. A lot of our patients would start to start losing the hair on the top of their head. Um, and then we would see mood changes. We would see patients who were, again, they were supposed to be getting better. Their mental health was supposed to be getting better. A lot of times it was not doing what we thought it was going to do. And if you were on feminizing hormones, you would start growing breast tissue. Your fat would move. Um, and again, if you were put on blockers first, it would render you potentially infertile for life. And now we also know for the kids, the, the boys, if we block you and put you on feminizing hormones, we also are potentially making you have sexual dysfunction for life. What, what, what do you mean by sexual dysfunction? So in the boys, blockers make it so that they never grow the penis or the testicles. If you never go through puberty and you never have those hormones affect that area, you are left with the same kind of penis size that you would have that kids have when they're little before they go through puberty. And then also we knew that the feminizing hormones would make it so you had a lot of erectile dysfunction, the testicles would shrink and atrophy, and we would be causing changes to that part of the body that were irreversible. I hate to state the obvious, but those are some pretty major changes for a young person to undergo and experience. And the fact that a young person could have that start happening to them after seeing a therapist twice and an endocrinologist once, to me, does not ethically line up. <laughs> 